and everything going on. And I just want to first extend uh, uh, my thoughts and prayers to all the folks that have suffered so much uh, during uh, this crisis and want you to know that we are here 24-7. Uh, the team is ready to assist in any way possible, uh, in any way that we can help you, not only in the manufacturing world, in your businesses, but uh, in anything that you need personally. Uh, we have been uh, at the helm 24-7, uh, helping folks try to navigate these turbulent waters. So um, that being said, as we talk about U.S. manufacturing, I just want you to know I'm a firm believer in U.S. manufacturing and COVID-19 has highlighted the need uh, for us to make it here and sell it there and, and to not be dependent on supply chains, uh, resources, rare earths and other materials to the degree uh, that we saw the pandemic uh, bring to light. And so with these panelists, with these resources that are out there, uh, we want you to know uh, that what we're trying to do uh, is to bring U.S. manufacturing to the 21st century level where that advanced manufacturing allows us to control our own destiny in America, allows us to compete on the international level uh, and allows us to start building things again uh, here in America and manufacturing uh, these great items that you guys are all involved with. And um, so we have a great uh, group of folks. Uh, today, we're gonna kick it off with innovation, uh, but I will tell you, we're gonna have uh, uh, panelists from Kevin Brady, who's the former chairman or the chairman on our side, on the Republican side of the Ways and Means Committee, um, who led the charge through tax reform, knows the tax code inside and out. He'll be joining us at one of these sessions. I'll be hosting uh, that session. And uh, we have a bipartisan uh, sh session on the agenda where Josh Gottheimer and I will talk about the work we're doing in the Problem Solvers Caucus, trying to unite the country, unite the, issue, uh, unite the uh, Congress on issues that we can agree upon. And U.S. manufacturing is one of those uh, items that brings people together uh, here in Washington and across uh, the country. And then finally, on Friday, uh, uh, we have the Treasury Secretary joining us. Steven Mnuchin will be here um, to take your input, uh, to take your questions, and to have the Treasury Secretary spend an hour with us. Um, I hope you take advantage of uh, He's a, a great guy. I've gotten to know him uh, over the years. And I can tell you, he's got a great mind. Uh, he knows uh, this area very well and he's committed to US manufacturing. And so as we go forward, just want you to know, uh, we're a firm believer uh, in US manufacturing and we're a firm believer in being a resource uh, for you. And so I know we have a, a great panel uh, here, Allison, that you're gonna be controlling and uh, going through uh, the exchange on innovation and security in the uh, uh, issues that are facing US manufacturers. But just want you to know, we're excited about this sixth annual manufacturing summit, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Team Reed, Allison, and all the folks behind the scenes uh, that have put this together and uh, that have uh, you know, used the technology to replace that good old fashioned in-person type of summit that we've grown accustomed to. But we're trying to make the best of it just like everyone else. And hopefully you enjoy this summit and find the resources a value, uh, valuable to you and uh, know that they're here and readily uh, accessible to you through us or directly through any of the resources that, that you have available to you. So thank you very much. And with that, Allison, I'll turn it over to you. Great, and uh, as you can probably see, Tom is actually down in DC right now. Um, and I do know that there have some activities going on today, so he might have to step out briefly. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. I apologize, but uh, there's a lot of things going on in DC right now. Um, so he's been a little busy lately with the Problem Solvers Caucus package. Um, but I appreciate you all joining and I just wanna get started. I am, again, we are using our technology today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with a video. Um, we have a video from, uh, let me find it here. Oh, it's not popping up. Well, it's on one of these. Just give me one moment. I do apologize. It was loaded and now it is not anymore. So I appear to be having a little bit of a technical difficulty, but this is round one. I do have a video from somebody in the Department of Energy that wanted to share their resources with you this morning. And I'm gonna share my screen here just momentarily. Thank you. And it's a pleasure. Let's see. There we go. Pleasure to be able to join you today. 
I'd especially like to thank Congressman Tom Reed for the invitation to talk a little bit about the Department of Energy and advanced manufacturing. My name is Connor Brahoska, and I'm the Chief Commercialization Officer of the United States Department of Energy and the Director of the Office of Technology Transitions. A lot of words in that title, but basically we're responsible in the Office of Technology Transitions and in my role as the Chief Commercialization Officer of ensuring we maximize the impact of the Department of Energy's roughly $20 billion of research and development, development that we spend annually. We at OTT like to think of ourselves as the front door. When you have such a vast complex of 17 national labs, including Brookhaven up in New York, across the country, it's tough to know who to call and what offices to connect with. And so at the Office of Technology Transitions, we would like to be your front door, and we work hard to ensure that we promote the great technologies, and we'll talk about some of those today, the amazing opportunities that there are to work with our researchers, and then also making sure that people are aware of some of the amazing facilities, such as the light sources at Brookhaven National Lab, where the Air Force is currently testing the integrity of newly manufactured structures. From Erie Canal to Silicon Alley, New York has played an historic role in our nation's economic and technology development. And that doesn't change today. We're facing great new possibilities, industries of the future, such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and of course, advanced manufacturing. These areas, the president has insisted we stay in the lead and continue to keep America at the forefront as worldwide leaders of these future industries. We're taking a broad spectrum approach to advanced manufacturing, involving research and development on everything from advanced batteries to additive manufacturing, to accelerated PPE manufacturing for the current fight against COVID-19. A few weeks ago, just September 10th, we joined the Department of Commerce, Defense, and state in launching the Federal Consortium for Advanced Batteries. The consortium is designed to accelerate the development of secure, robust domestic industrial base for artificial batteries, for, excuse me, for advanced batteries. And specifically to provide a cooperative framework among federal agencies for developing advanced battery technologies and establishing a domestic supply of lithium batteries. In turn, the consortium builds on our energy storage grand challenge that we have here at the Department of Energy. It's a comprehensive department-wide program to accelerate the development, commercialization, and utilization of next generation storage technologies here in the United States. Or as we like to say, design here, build here, sell everywhere. At OTT, we're handling the technology transition track of that effort. With the ESGC, or the Energy Storage Grand Challenge, we're focused on all aspects of the supply chain, ranging from advanced development to reuse and recycling. This includes our lithium ion battery recycling prize, which is designed to incentivize entrepreneurs to develop and demonstrate scalable processes that have the potential to profitably capture 90% of all discarded or spent lithium ion batteries for the recovery of their key materials so that we can reintroduce them to the US supply chain. And just last year, two of the researchers we've supported, Stanley Wittenham and John Goodenough, won two th the 2019 Nobel Prize for Chemistry for the development of the lithium ion batteries. The work in advanced energy storage complements one of our great largely unknown advanced manufacturing successes at DOE. Specifically, researchers at our Idaho National Lab developed a new class of nanostructural steel that has transformed the manufacturing, mining, and automotive industries. The steel minimizes weight while improving material flexibility without sacrificing safety or strength. It has increased vehicle fuel economy by nearly 10%, and as a consequence, has become one of the most widely used materials in the automotive industry. We're also doing a great deal of other work in advanced vehicle technologies. This past July, Secretary Briette announced $139 million in federal funding 
for 55 projects across the country supporting new and innovative advanced vehicle technology. We re the research that will be done in a range of areas, once again, includes advanced batteries, electrification, and advanced manufacturing, introducing the use of fiber reinforced polymer composites for vehicle applications. Carbon fiber technology has many important manufacturing applications and is being used in products ranging from airplanes to golf clubs to bicycles. We hope to advance the work that even that work even further with the private sector through research at our unique carbon fiber technology facility at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. The facility is in the department's home for carbon fiber innovation, but it's only one part of the lab's manufacturing demonstration facility, a 110,000 square foot facility designed to drive the development of new materials, systems, software for additive manufacturing, and research across the range. Work there has been exceptionally important this year in accelerating the production of face shields, masks, and other essential personal protection equipment as part of our response to COVID-19. To give you just one example, researchers at the facility collaborated with N95 mask inventor Peter Tai to produce mask filtration material on equipment typically used for carbon fiber production. Oak Ridge is transferring the technology to industry partners such as Cummins, which can now produce enough filter media to supply more than a million face masks and respirators per day to US healthcare facilities. Those efforts, both against COVID-19 and in advanced manufacturing as a whole, have been and will be further catalyzed by the department's work in other related areas, such as high-performance computing, artificial intelligence, and as I mentioned before, quantum computing. Like my home state of Texas, New York has always sought to dream bigger, push further, and reach higher. At the Department of Energy, we're looking for that kind of spirit to help us solve some of the world's biggest and toughest problems and transform them into products that make Americans' lives better and keep us more secure. It's what we've been doing at the Department of Energy since our inception as the Manhattan Project, solve big problems. And the problems of today are no different. And we look forward to working with you and Congressman Tom Reed as we move forward in solving those problems. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, uh, again, that is Connor Prohaska. He's the Chief Commercialization Officer for the Department of Energy and Director as Office of Technology Transitions. So big, long title there, but uh, we're glad to have his support here for this event today. And we look forward to continuing to work with the Department of Energy um, and connecting any of you uh, with them as you uh, look at advanced manufacturing. We are gonna dive right into our speakers. Um, this gentleman has been with us before. Mike Molnar is the founding director of the Office of Advanced Manufacturing at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, in this capacity, he is responsible for NIST extramural advanced manufacturing programs and liaison to industry and academia. Mike is also founding director of the Advanced Manufacturing National Program Office, an interagency team with core staff host at, hosted at NIST. The interagency team works to coordinate federal activities in advanced manufacturing and is the congressionally designated National Program Office for Manufacturing USA, the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation. He joined NIST in 2011. Prior to the federal service, Mike had a 30 year industry uh, career in advanced manufacturing with leadership roles in manufacturing technology development, corporate manufacturing, engineering, capital planning, quality systems, automation, computer integrated manufacturing, and industrial controls for manufacturing competitiveness. Mid-career, Mike served as the Manufacturing Policy Fellow in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Mike is well known, clearly based on all of his activities, <laughs> with over 30 years of leadership roles in manufacturing, professional societies, and associations, most recently as the president of the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. He is a licensed professional engineer, certified manufacturing engineer, and was elected fellow of both the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. He earned his MBA, executive MBA, from the University of Notre Dame and a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and master's in manufacturing systems engineers from the University of Wisconsin. So he has quite the resume and he's looking forward to chatting with all of you. So without further ado, Mike. 
Oh, terrific. So glad to be with you this morning. Can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, terrific. Uh, I'm going to try the share screen as instructed. And I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited to be here um, joining, uh, joining Congressman Reed again for the uh, Advanced Manufacturing Summit. Um, I'm glad to follow our good friends at the Department of Energy. We work very, very closely with them. I'm part of that, uh, uh, that battery consortium. And he mentioned a couple of things in advanced manufacturing, uh, several of those that manufacturing demonstration facility and carbon fibers and composites, that's part of Manufacturing USA. So I'm really pleased to be with you this morning. And uh, really the, the, the beginning of this slide, if you see all of those agency logos, it's because one of the goals here is to form a whole of government team to really partner with industry and academia. Um, in, in the short time that we have, the, the goal was, I wanted to introduce NIST and set some, set some things up for not only me, but my, my friend and colleague, uh, Carol Thomas, but give you an update on Manufacturing USA. This first slide, I think many of you are aware of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, you think of this as the campus just north of Washington, DC. But the purpose of this slide is to show that uh, NIST is much more than that. There's the, there's the main campus in Gaithersburg. The middle picture on the right is the campus in Boulder, Colorado. But the, the, the map here shows that not only that, but we have joint institutes and centers. How we work with industry is by partnerships. That includes the NIST uh, Center at Brookhaven National Lab up in New York. Um, interesting fact on the bottom there, that is the radio uh, station signal station at Fort Collins, Colorado. That last year celebrated its centennial, its 100 years of operation. That's the thing, if you get a wall clock that says atomic clock and it automatically synchronizes, that's the signal that, that, uh, uh, that it links to. And that is the oldest operating radio station in the world. So it just shows that NIST is part of standards uh, the time division synchronizes things like, like the internet, the power grid, GPS, but also because of that little picture on, on the lower right, all of your wall clocks or watches that say synchronized to an atomic clock, that's where it's coming from. Um, where manufacturing is very big, of course, at NIST because of our mission of innovation and working with industry, we have a lot of programs in the NIST laboratories, but our two uh, principal extramural programs in this space, Manufacturing USA and the Hollings Manufacturing and Extension Partnership. Carol leads MEP, she'll be followed right after, um, uh, she'll be coming right after me. And my goal here is to update you on Manufacturing USA, how it's doing today and where it's going. Uh, so let's dive right in on Manufacturing USA. I think you know that Tom Reed is a pretty special um, representative in Congress. You may not know that uh, Manufacturing USA as the program was created in 2014 under this, under this bill called the Revitalized Manufacturing Innovation Act or RAMI. Uh, Congressman Reed was the principal Republican House sponsor. And just to show you how strongly bipartisan manufacturing is, that passed in the House, 51 Democrats, 49 Republicans, uh, how even uh, is that in terms of co-sponsors of the bill? Uh, it passed by uh, unanimous consent as well. Manufacturing USA was, was just reauthorized by Congress with some new authorities and responsibilities further strengthening the program. So our mission here is connecting people, ideas, and technology. Uh, it's really driven by, these are applied research institutes. It's not about discovery. It's about uh, I mentioned the DOE Center um, in composites. We've discovered composites. The goal of that institute is to dramatically decrease the cost of this by 50%, uh, decrease the energy usage by 70%, and increase the recyclability of these carbon fiber composites by 90%. So this is not discovery, but scale up, de-risking, and making these technologies uh, proven and readily available to industry. It's, so it's all of these uh, uh, institutes are about industrial competitiveness. The projects and portfolio are driven by industry. And of course, the reason why this is so important is because manufacturing is critically important to our economic security 
and our national security. Uh, in the re reauthorization, we gained a ninth uh, objective in the original RAMI. It was about competitiveness, American leadership, scaling up technology, allowing companies to come to an institute and use shared resources, workforce development. This is an interesting thing that even now uh, with, with such disruptions to the supply chain, uh, manufacturers still struggle with finding a workforce of the right skills. And so for these advanced new technologies, how do we work together to address the workforce skills gaps? It's about knowledge transfer, partnership, manufacturing employment uh, for the industries of the future. And this new one was just added this past December in the reauthorization is to strengthen innovation ecosystems. Where we are today with Manufacturing USA is uh, 14 active institutes. And there's two more, the ones that are uh, shaded in dark blue, they will be announced very shortly within, within the next month. Cymani on cybersecurity for manufacturing, it was announced that this, this uh, the hub will be down in San Antonio, but again, where all of these are, these are national institutes, uh, regional impact, uh, regional hubs for national impact. So uh, what happens later on in October is that the award will be made for Simani, and that's when the Institute becomes active. The next one is on bioindustrial manufacturing. So it'll be the third biomanufacturing Institute with the NIST sponsored Nimble on a biopharmaceutical manufacturing and the uh, DOD sponsored Institute on regenerative manufacturing. So, um, this will be announced and launched also expected in just a few weeks. A couple of quick uh, metrics for you. The program is alive and well since the establishment uh, back in 2014, uh, had a nearly 50% increase in membership. So what this means is a, a company, a university, a small manufacturer joins an institute that is one. So of this, uh, nearly 2,000 members in the past year, and this is really exciting that the uh, nearly two thirds of those are manufacturers and over two thirds of those are small manufacturers. That's critically important because as we all know, the lifeblood of manufacturing, when people think of the large manufacturers, they're tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers. Those are the large, uh, those are the small and medium sized manufacturers which is representing over 95% of the manufacturers in the United States today. Um, this is phenomenal. There are other programs uh, around the world. Nobody is catalyzing the level of uh, activities and the level of co-investment uh, uh, as in Manufacturing USA. Our goal is to have a one-to-one. -one. So for every public dollar uh, supporting a project, uh, another dollar of non-federal funding, largely from industry is there, we're running nearly three to one investment match. So in terms of the program at the 14 institutes, $133 million last year that catalyzed another $355 million of non-federal. I think no other metric shows the value to industry of having such high levels of co-investment. The third is the education of workforce skills. Over, over 39,000 people participated in workforce development training programs at the institutes. And the last, of course, is are they doing these transformative projects? And so 561 major collaborative R&D projects active uh, last year, a huge growth uh, over the, the prior year. So the point of this very brief update on Manufacturing USA is that these are industry-led private uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, it is something that if you are interested or you are in this sector, we'd like to have you uh, consider being engaged with one of these institutes, whether it's the MXD, the Manufacturing Times Digital Institute, the Remade Institute up in Rochester, uh, New York, the, um, the Rapid Institute uh, located in New York itself, New York City, uh, the um, uh, AIM Photonics in uh, the packaging facility in Rochester and the, the main fab uh, facility uh, in, in uh, Albany, New York, uh, or any of the above. Um, we mentioned additive manufacturing, America Makes is the 
Institute for Additive Manufacturing. If you have any questions, please come to our website, manufacturingusa.com, or please uh, send me a question. We'd be happy to follow up with you. With that, thank you uh, so much. I'll stop sharing screen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, and they are a great resource. And again, we will share contact information um, following these presentations, but please don't hesitate to reach out to us to make the connection or directly to Mike. I'm sure he'd be happy to chat with any businesses looking to, to grow. Um, we're going to move over on now to Carol, uh, Carol Thomas. She was recently named National Institute of Standards and Technologies Acting Associate Director of Innovation and Industry Services and also serves as the Director of the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. In addition to the MET program, Ms. Thomas also provides senior leadership for the NIST Office of Advanced Manufacturing, Baldred Performance Excellence Program, and the Technology Partnerships Office. For the past five years, her efforts have mainly focused on the MEP National Network, which helps U.S. manufacturers compete globally by strengthening supply chains and helping them access new technology. MEP, with its $146 million federal budget and matched private investment, is a $300 million public-private partnership leveraging federal support by teaming with industry as well as state and local organizations to be the go-to resource for US, U.S. manufacturers. With over 400 manufacturing extension offices located in all 50 states and Puerto Rico, MEP services provide measurable enhanced growth, improved productivity, and expand capacity. With more than 30 years of entrepreneurial and small business development experience, Ms. Thompson's accomplished public-private sector career demonstrates her leadership expertise as a catalyst for creative, innovative partnerships in advocating economic development by supporting dynamic, innovative ecosystems. She is a leader, graduate of Leadership Washington and a former regional director of the Fashion Group International of Greater Washington, D.C. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Drexel in Design and a Master of Business Administration from John Hopkins University in International Business. And without further ado, I see Carol has got her slides up there. Yes, I do. Thank you, Allison. Thank you so much. And thank you, Congressman Tom Reed. You are an angel for manufacturing. We love you and we thank you for always giving these uh, wonderful manufacturing summits. So I'm going to get right to it. Um, hopefully, uh, the, you all have heard of the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. And if you haven't, by the end of this, I'm sure you will. Well, uh, we are a public-private partnership, um, much like uh, what the um, Manufacturing USA Institutes are doing, where there are public funds as well as private funds that come together uh, with the expertise to help. Um, and our mission is simply to strengthen and empower U.S. manufacturers. We focus solely on manufacturing, and we uh, look at particularly the the breadth of manufacturers in the small and medium size. And we are across the country in all 50 states in Puerto Rico, as Allison said. And uh, as you can see, uh, each area has their own uh, name because uh, <clears throat> these organizations actually uh, grew up with their manufacturing communities, their ecosystems. And in that are able to understand uh, very clearly what manufacturers need. Uh, and so uh, some very unfortunate uh, this year, uh, we uh, started out great in uh, January and then all of a sudden um, it got a little weird in February and then March we had the pandemic. For manufacturing, uh, that, was, uh, that month was the single largest uh, drop in manufacturing in 74 years. It was uh, not just in the U.S., though. It started uh, outside of the U.S., came to the U.S. It's global. It uh, impacts everything that we've uh, done, every supply chain uh, that we're working with. Uh, in some cases, uh, the adaptation and the flexibility have allowed uh, some of the supply chains to um, work even quicker and be even more uh, adaptable. But in other cases, uh, it just broke the, the supply supply chains and we were not able uh, to do what we needed to do. And particularly in the lower levels, uh, there was a problem. But the MEP National Network, we started uh, and got together in a coordinated uh, response. Uh, there was, of course, the need for personal protection equipment and uh, the national uh, supply uh, scouting services that we offer that uh, allow for us to uh, 
scour the entire U.S. if they're looking for suppliers or um, with uh, certain materials, certain capabilities, and uh, bring them together to make uh, what's needed. Uh, also connecting with testing laboratories. There were quite a few companies that did uh, uh, pivoted to uh, make masks and uh, various other types of personal protection equipment that was needed. And so uh, they needed uh, to be tested, some uh, to be able to get through the FDA testing uh, in a very quick time. Uh, the MEP National Network was uh, able to help a lot of manufacturers with that uh, in particular. Uh, and then uh, the workforce, how to bring your company, uh, your employees into your uh, facilities and so that they could produce uh, what, uh, you know, continue to work and be uh, in production, but in a safe environment. Uh, our MEP centers came together and we have, I would say, some of the best uh, employee safe, uh, safety uh, best practices around. Um, we shared the information across the country and, um, and shared the resources that we found out. Uh, about uh, such as the SBA uh, Paycheck Protection Program and some other uh, types of resources that uh, you needed. And I had mentioned FDA before. Uh, the approval process, uh, the FDA was able to uh, go to a uh, expedited uh, approval process, which the MEP was able uh, to help uh, companies with. Uh, and then uh, some of you have heard of the Coronavirus A Relief and uh, Economic Security Act. This is the CARES Act. For the first time ever, the MEP program received this, uh, disaster funding to support U.S. manufacturers. Uh, we received $50 million just for um, supporting manufacturers to help them prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus. Um, we also brought together our trusted advisors across the country so that every center, uh, including um, our uh, organizations in New York, were able to uh, be able to leverage, take advantage of um, things that uh, in South Carolina, in Wisconsin, in Mississippi, uh, in Oregon, everything that we learned uh, as uh, experts in manufacturing, we were able to share across. Um, and, and that includes um, providing information um, to the, uh, our uh, MEP centers in New York. Uh, there was so much that was going on. It was very hard to, uh, you know, keep uh, accounting of everything that was going on because it was going on so quickly. It was all in re real time that we were working on. Uh, there were industries like automotive and aerospace that were hit tremendously. And we worked with several of their suppliers uh, to, to help pivot into the areas that, that needed. We have uh, 51 centers across uh, the country and all 51 together uh, were helping out this. Every single MEP center had a site just for um, uh, helping and providing information and, and contact um, in regards to the coronavirus. Uh, the New York MEP uh, man had manufacturing solutions that received $2.6 million in CARE Act funds. Um, and in that, here are some of the uh, business solution examples that uh, we were helping with. Uh, exporting and re uh, reshoring became, uh, uh, there was a lot of interest in that. Uh, of course, the workforce development, uh, there's uh, various different types of business growth services that had to do with technology, that had to do with cybersecurity. Cybersecurity really became a big issue uh, during this period of time. Risk mitigation, uh, another area that, um, you know, really a lot of questions, a lot of uh, manufacturers were looking for help in that supply chain and supplier scouting. I had mentioned that uh, before. Th this is just a few examples of what we offer. And throughout New York, now I know this is a bit of an eye chart for you, but hopefully you can see, we have several uh, different, I would say, uh, uh, hubs of uh, manufacturing experts uh, throughout the large state of New York. And so um, statewide, Fuse Hub uh, is there, uh, and they help uh, guide access to their whole network of industry experts. I call the New York MEP um, their own network of manufacturing solutions because they have so much and so many across 
uh, the state of New York. And these are all that you can take advantage of and um, connect with them. And all you have to do is go to your favorite search engine and put in New York uh, NYMEP, and it will take you to the website so you can see and get connected uh, to these uh, various different um, manufacturing expertise hubs. But I don't want you to forget this Friday, Big day. It's our manufacturing day uh, for uh, 2020. Uh, manufacturing day is always the very first Friday in October. And what we've found over the years of uh, celebrating manufacturing day uh, is that uh, it has helped people to understand that manufacturing is no longer dark, dirty, and dangerous. It is now um, into advanced uh, technologies and uh, using uh, new types of equipment, new processes, uh, and connecting uh, from end to end. Uh, this is what manufacturing is today. And so I thank you very much for this short period of time that I've had with you. Uh, I wish you all the best. I know uh, New York Strong is uh, what uh, I like to uh, uh, say about our, our uh, manufacturers in, um, in New York. And so good luck with that. And reach out to your NEP center. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Carol. And I and we can't say enough about our MEP centers uh, locally. They've done a fantastic job. So um, we know we've gotten a lot of positive feedback. So I appreciate you joining us and uh, advocating for, uh, for people to reach out to them because it's a truly important resource. Uh, last Thank but you. not least, we're going to move to uh, Holly Huber. Um, this is a, a special one for us this year. We haven't had a lot of cybersecurity conversations uh, over our past manufacturing summits. And Holly, we actually connected through a group that we've put together to cover Western New York and talk about economic development uh, through a variety of facets. And we happened to have a conversation about the manufacturing summit. And she offered to uh, do a little presentation today on cybersecurity. So her company, which she's the founder of, Global Security IQ, is a collaboration of active and retired law enforcement officers and private sector IT engineers who are highly skilled in cybersecurity, intelligence, and cyber education. Founder Holly Hubert retired from the FBI with 25 years of experience in multiple disciplines. As an assistant special agent in charge, Hubert was the executive responsible for the FBI's Buffalo Cyber Program and founder of the FBI Buffalo Cyber Task Force in 2002. She secured federal funding for the Western New York Regional Computer Forensics Laboratory, one of only 15 FBI laboratory division affiliated state-of-the-art facilities dedicated to the science of digital forensics. She also established and served on the WNYRCFL Executive Board. She completed her undergraduate degree in IT, holds a master's in leadership and communication. During her FBI career, Hubert taught internationally and was a member of the FBI Training Division's adjunct faculty on the topics of leadership, intelligence, and cyber matters. She continues to lecture and keynote in those areas. And we are just honored to have her. Um, it's a little bit of a different branch of today's topic, but we believe it's truly important for people to be thinking about cybersecurity, especially with all of all of the technology we're currently using, and I'm sure we'll continue to use um, now and in the future. Holly? Thank you very much, Allison. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, and thank you to uh, Congressman Reed and certainly to Team Reed. Um, this is a, an exciting opportunity, and uh, thank you, Carol and Mike. I think that, uh, Carol, it was great to have you touch on cybersecurity as, as part of the MEP, and it, you know, it dovetails together. I wanted to just first take a minute and talk about the threats you know, that I, that I learned from my uh, FBI career and certainly never more now being in private industry and in the incident response business. Believe me, as a former FBI agent, I would much rather be on the prevention side and certainly in the manufacturing. So it's an honor and, you know, I'm very passionate about manufacturing. And so it's an honor to talk to all of you. So I'd like to go through a couple of the major, the two major threats um, in the cybersecurity realm, and then a little bit about what, what to do about them. So the two major threats, if everyone can see my screen, are ransomware and what's known as business email compromise. Now, I think everybody knows what ransomware is. And there was actually a recent survey of 500 companies that shows 59% of organizations have had some sort of ransomware attack just in this last year. Now, some companies have really good programs in place where they can roll backwards in a, in a ransomware attack and overcome it. 
And some companies, unfortunately, do not have good backups and really succumb to ransomware attacks and have heavy, heavy financial um, um, penalties or losses, I should say. And um, certainly they have difficulties overcoming it from a business perspective. Uh, the average cost of a ransomware incident is over $700,000 for those companies that don't pay. Now, interestingly, we talk about paying versus non-paying. Law enforcement will always tell you not to pay. If you pay, it could make you um, actually susceptible to another future attack. And there's no guarantee that if you pay a ransomware attacker that you'll actually get the decryption key that you need to get your data back. So it's very, very important to consider what you would do if you didn't pay. Now we have a new flavor of ransomware that has really, ransomware has shifted in the last nine months. It used to be companies would, or attackers would lock up organizations with ransomware attacks and then companies would actually panic and pay if they didn't have good backups. Now companies are, or I'm sorry, the attackers are actually exfilling or stealing private information first and then those companies that do have good back, back uh, ups and do not have to pay, they're being extorted anyway because the attackers are extorting um, you know, a further payment so data isn't spilled into the dark web. So the, they're, they're, attackers have become very, very sophisticated. Of those companies that pay, it's usually a $1.5 million loss. And it's a little bit of a misnomer. A lot of companies think, oh, I'm small, attackers aren't after me, but that's really not true. We see just as much attacks on small companies as we do large companies. And as you know, small companies really make up 98% of the companies in the United States. So organizations, when they don't pay, they risk uh, downtime or when they have a ransomware attack, they have a loss of downtime in their computing infrastructure, a loss of their people productivity. They have to buy new devices. They have networks costs. They have lost opportunities. And then maybe the embarrassment of uh, the ransomware. And also duties to report and notify. So it can be very, very embarrassing to have a ransomware attack. But that's one of their biggest cyber threats. The other is what's known as a business email compromise. And the FBI has an entity that probably most of you know about called the Internet Crime Complaint Center. They collect a lot of stats on cybercrime, and those stats generally have to do with Internet frauds, intrusions, and business email compromise and ransomware attacks. And altogether, um, organizational, or as a country, we've had over $3 billion in losses in 2019. And over half of those losses are attributed to business email compromises. And I'll just spend one second going through that. Again, everybody knows what a ransomware attack is, but with a business email compromise, it's also known as an email account compromise. That is when an individual's business email is compromised and then they become the targets of a sophisticated scam in which individuals attempt to have uh, payments routed to uh, new bank accounts. They, they come up with schemes and stories to coerce individuals into routing or tricking them into routing uh, fin money to uh, external and new bank accounts. Those are very significant losses we see a lot of um, attacks and a surge in the construction sector and in the manufacturing sector. So the CMMC, for those of you that, govern, that manufacture on behalf of the DOD, I'm sure you heard of CMMC, you know about it. Certainly if you're a prime and you're on the Zoom call, certainly you know about it. A lot of the um, uh, subcontractors in a prime's uh, uh, supply chain are now trying to figure out the CMMC, but it's a requirement of the DOD to s implement a set of standards. Now, as an organization, if you, whether you make tires or whether you make rock, rocket launchers in the supply chain, everybody has to have a cybersecurity program that complies with the CMMC. The level with which you have to comply depends on the degree of classified information that you handle so 
to get individuals ready, to get organizations ready, it's a good idea to do a gap analysis. Now, if you um, previously manufactured for DOD, you're very used to the NIST 800-171 cybersecurity requirement, which was formerly a self-assessment. But that um, it can be very technical, and you know we still had we still had attacks. We still have many many cyber attacks, and so DoD moved from the self assessment checklist to this program of CMMC, where there are individual certifiers that will be certifying your compliance against um, a, the set of cybersecurity best practices. So I do recommend at this time that in advance of your readiness. Uh, to be CMMC compliance, that you do a gap analysis and actually have a seasoned practitioner tell you if you have certain controls in place and if you don't, how you can get certain mitigating controls in place. Cybersecurity, it's really a, it's really a new field. It's a new, it's a new partnership that in which is required with a business IT provider. So all of our organizations, you might have um, an onboard uh, employee that's really responsibility is to make your business run. So that's what I would call a business IT provider, or perhaps you outsource it to a business pr provider, a business IT provider organization. But it's really a new skill set to have a cybersecurity practitioner partner with your business IT provider to have the right checks and balances in place and together to have a very, very strong team to assess and apply, again, those cybersecurity mitigating controls to help strengthen and harden your cybersecurity posture. In the manufacturing realm, you have to think about IoT, IoT devices and innovative internet um, connected devices. Generally, those devices, when they're created, they're created to run and work and they serve some innovative purpose but not often created or crafted with cybersecurity in mind. So the IoT devices um, are often wireless based or Bluetooth based on your computer networks and it serves as a really big vulnerability. So you really have to think about a comprehensive type of assessment. And I'll just talk about, even if you're not bound by DOD or you don't manufacture for B DOD, of course, it's a, a night, you know, the best practice absolutely to have what's known as a vulnerability assessment. Now, cybersecurity pr practitioners sometimes use confusing language. I often hear vulnerability scan confused with penetration test and a vulnerability scan confused with a vulnerability assessment and a risk assessment confused with uh, vulnerability scanning. So just take a second and explain to you just how these terms work. So when you are um, looking for these services in your organizations that you're, you're, you're really looking for apples and apples and, and can distinguish. So a vulnerability assessment really is two things. It's a risk assessment. And we heard Carol talk about the assessment of risk under the MEPs, but a risk assessment, that, in, that is a statement of risk and a measure of risk. And you should have um, the output will have criticalities measured as a five. Usually you get a, an enumeration of one through five with one being informational and five being a critical risk. The mission of the risk assessment is to comprehensively address risk. A good practitioner will use a framework such as the NIST cybersecurity framework um, which has over 100 cybersecurity controls over there. And you can think of a control as a cybersecurity best practice. The output of that is going to generally be a PDF document that's informational. The mission of that document is to inform leadership, executive leadership on their business risks posed to them by the cybersecurity risks. So again, that document should be really a foundational instrument that memorializes the cybersecurity posture of your overall organization. Complementing the risk assessment would be a vulnerability scan. This is designed for IT. It's a really technical instrument. It's a technical output. A good practitioner will scan for missed patches, 
open ports or other technical vulnerabilities. It's really not meant for the CEO or the CFO or the COO. It's meant for the IT practitioners to understand um, what technical vulnerabilities and mispatches there are in their environment. So together, those two things, the risk assessment plus the vulnerability scan really constitute what's called a vulnerability assessment. And whether you manufacture for DOD or not, these two foundational things really help put together a, a very healthy cybersecurity uh, program and make sure that you're in a hardened state. So I'll, I'll leave that with the final point of when you are uh, looking for practitioners to do uh, cybersecurity uh, vulnerability assessment, look for those badges and those buttons, look for certifications because in this business, credentials and experience really, really do matter. Um, I see that some um, maybe early practitioners that aren't a season going out and using the, the framework, but really not understanding the spirit of each control and what's underneath it. So you, you really should make sure that you're testing the practitioner's uh, knowledge uh, in their credentials and experience. And so with that, Allison, I can turn my uh, screen sharing off and turn it back to the group um, for questions. Thank you. And I do want to thank Mike, Carol, and Holly uh, for joining us this morning. We do have time for some questions. I do want to remind um, anybody that is joining this morning, um, if you are interested in sharing this video um, with anybody at a later time or going back and watching the video again, it is on our YouTube channel. So if you just go search Tom Reed in YouTube, we actually are going to, going to save it there as well. So it can be shared widely with people that might not have been able to attend this morning. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that have come in. I'm going to go um, Sam Samantha. I know you are with F Finger Lakes Community College, I believe, Sam. I did just try to unmute you. Yes. There you go. Go ahead. So I had a question for Mike uh, Molnar. Uh, I saw the number of uh, students who were trained was around 32,000. And I believe that we would want to scale that up by a factor of 10 in order to really extract uh, value in terms of economic development as well as uh, job creation. So how do we go about doing that, Mike? Yes, uh, thank you so much for your question. So what this metric is, is in direct educational uh, uh, experiences with an institute. Institutes aren't in the business of providing education themselves. That is because their members are universities, community colleges, other. So the, the role of an institute uh, isn't to train, it is to work with industry and educational um, uh, institutions to assess for this new emerging technology, what are the gaps that we have in, in, in uh, engineers and in scientists, in operators, in students, the whole gamut, uh, what, what's not available today? And so the, 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 the mission here is through this public-private partnership is, okay, we have this gap. How do we work to solve what are the educational materials and then work together to develop that? And then the actual delivery of that, that's best done at universities, community colleges, uh, technical schools. So I just wanted to clarify, absolutely agree with you that uh, we can always do more, but in fact, the metric here shouldn't be delivery of all, it is the delivery happening at, um, at uh, the institutes themselves. I think what's exciting though is the scale up as something is developed and it's transitioned. We, we don't track how many times a course is, is taught at a university, community college or so, something like that. But um, I do wanna clarify, that's the role of partnership because of course, institutes aren't there to compete with, they're there to help uh, uh, these educational institutions. Uh, also, uh, since you did bring it up, I think with the national pandemic, it just underscores how much we can be doing online and a number of the new pilot uh, training programs are indeed for virtual delivery. 
uh, online. I think that uh, a lot of upside there. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Sam and Mike. Um, we did have a couple of questions come in, one from a person that does not have a microphone, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask it. Um, what is something every company should be doing today, and I think this is more for Holly, to enhance their cybersecurity? Um, just any basics? I know you covered some of it, but like if you were gonna pick one thing today, it sounds like that's what they're looking for. Well, I'll give them two things today. <laughs> Comprehensively, <laughs> do have a risk assessment and if you have a skilled practitioner or use a framework like the NIST cybersecurity framework they'll get a comprehensive picture of things they, they can do if there's one thing i would want everybody to do right now is think about remote access and any kind of access into your network you should have a long and strong password on every single account that you have. It should be have have uh, at least 15 characters. Now we're using pass phrases that are complicated with symbols and numbers, and then also use multi-factor authentication with that wherever possible. Whether you're at work or you're at home on your bank accounts, your web bill pay, whatever that may be, do think about access. How do I allow people access to my data? Make sure it's very complicated and long and strong. And uh, the next question I had, I think it kind of goes in regards to, um, Carol uh, wrote in about the regional maps. And um, I'm just wondering, um, is that the place where companies should go for more resources to expand their capabilities in advanced manufacturing? If you were gonna recommend one place, would it just be directly to the local offices, Carol? Uh, yes, I would uh, definitely say go to the local office because they will know exactly oh, who you need to see and what you need to do um, based on uh, talking to and finding out where your pain point is. Okay, perfect. I do see Sam wrote one more question. I mean, this might be more for the workforce development panel that we're having on Thursday, Sam, but I will put it out to the panel. Um, how do we make workforce more resilient in the face of economic health or social disasters, recession of, eight, of 08, COVID, and the current joblessness of millions of Americans? That might be more for our workforce panel on Thursday, but any of our panelists have any comments on that? Sam, are you joining us on Thursday? <laughs> oh. Try to join. I have Perfect. some of the concurrent meeting, but I will try to join. Great. Well, I think our workforce panel would love to try to answer that question for you. So Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, I hope you're signed up. We are out of time. Um, I do want to remind everybody that we do have another panel today at four o'clock. Um, if you haven't signed up for today, please reach out to Taryn. Um, she can send you the information for that. It is with uh, Congressman Brady, the former chairman of Ways and Means, who helped pass tax reform. Um, and Tom will be on that one um, as well and um, opportunity to ask him questions. And we do have three additional panels this week. They are all besides this afternoon. The others are all at 10 a.m. each day. Um, so if you'd like to join any of those, please contact Taryn or any of our offices. We'll have the information as well. But Taryn is our go to and uh, making sure you all get the RSVP information. So thank you so much for joining and we look forward to seeing you participate in the other panels as well. And thank you to our panelists, of course, really appreciate your time and expertise and uh, willing to assist our manufacturers here in the 23rd district in upstate New York. Thank you. Thank all you right, so everybody have a great day. Bye -bye. We'll see you at four.